Lord Jesus, I pray that you are glorified in this message today. My longing is that it would not be I speaking, Lord, but it would be you speaking. That by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would convict our hearts of sin, draw us to repentance, and unite us together as one congregation because of our love for you. So I pray for the unity of this congregation that we may, um, as one body, be a place where we can confess our sins, repent, and in love and unity, do this thing called life together in your name, Lord Jesus. So I pray this in your holy and beautiful name. Amen. So we're approaching the end of our sermon series called Sin, Confession, and Life Together. Um, and when I started preaching on this sermon series, I really kind of got convicted that this is actually a, a sermon about revival, a sermon series about revival, because at the heart of revival is the confession of sin and repentance, and then it draws the body of Christ together in unity. And one of my big desires is that we, as a body of Christ, would see revival in our time, in our midst, and in our, in our own hearts. And I, I do believe that revival doesn't begin when all the, the world comes into the church, but it's when the church gets set on fire and then pours out into the world. That when we realize the, the grace and the forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ, that when we repent, confess our sins and repent, that we get set on fire. We get more unified as the body of Christ. And then we take that excitement, that fire out into the world, and the world is transformed because of what God's doing in our hearts. So I believe that, that revival is something that starts within us and pours out to the world around us. And that is my hope, is that, um, that as we go through this series, that it wouldn't be something we just hear on Sunday morning and then file away as that's good information, but that we would allow the word of God to create a revival in our hearts. And that we would be restored to one another in new ways. And that we would see the light and truth of the gospel penetrate the darkness that is all around us. I, I, I do honestly believe the only hope we have for our nation is revival. And that starts when we pray for revival within our own midst. And I'd like to see that. I believe it is true. I think I, we've been seeing elements of revival around our congregation, and I just can't wait for that day when it just explodes in wonderful ways by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the thing is, 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 as Tim Keller says, revivals can often be silent things because it's where God is working on our hearts, convicting us of our sins, turning us towards repentance. And that's a lot of what this sermon series was about, is that we would see the, the, the effects and the, the weight of our sin. We'd be longing to confess it to one another. And then we would draw together in unity as the body of Christ that we would represent God well, and that love we have would pour out of these walls. But the difficult thing is, is that confession is a scary thing to do. It, and it's an important part of repentance, that, that as we confess our sins, it helps us so that we can turn from those evil things that ensnare our heart and turn to God and his gospel. Turn to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the, the, the reason why I believe it's important that we confess our sins to one another is that as a body of Christ, when we do this well, it draws us closer to each other. There's a, when we in vulnerability confront those brokennesses that we have, we draw nearer together as a body of Christ. We pray for each other better. And, and it's not just confessing sins. 
But there's also times where the brokenness of this world has, has discouraged us and, and brought us low and we're able, we need to be able to confess, yes, I am in this time of, of a broken season and I just need another brother or sister in Christ to pray for me. And, and that when we do this, when we humble ourselves in this way, because that's really one of the key pieces of it is it requires deep humility to be able to confess your sins in this way, confess the pain of the brokenness of this world in this way. And when we do this well, we become unified as the body of Christ. This is when the world looks around and says, hey, those people love each other in a different way. The world realizes there's something going on different at Maranatha Bible Chapel because we can see the way they love each other in vulnerable and humble, broken ways. So as we're doing this, as we're confessing our sins, as we are living together, what does it really look like to live this life out together? Because there are specific ways that it can be carried out. There's very practical ways we do this life together we do this thing called life together. And, and so that's really the big question of today's sermon. Now that we've talked about all of the parts leading up to this moment, how do we live it out? What does it look like to live this life together? And so that's what we are going to be approaching. We're going to, last week we looked at the first half of Romans chapter 12. And this week we're going to be looking at the second half of Romans 12. And it's going to get very uh, specific. Paul's going to get very specific about how we live this life out together. And one of the things I love about Paul's writings, and specifically in Roman, is he goes and he talks about the beauty of the gospel in these very specific terms. And then he breaks out into a song of worship, and then he says, and now here's how it applies to your life. And, and, and very specific in real ways. And, and, and it's important because Paul realizes that the good news of the gospel of Christ isn't for just one moment when you pray the prayer of salvation, but it is for your entire life. That's why we do communion uh, at least once a month is so that we remind ourselves daily that the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, is for our entire lives. And then it changes how we live it out together with one another. So today we will be looking at Romans chapter 9, and, or I'm sorry, chapter 12, and we'll be starting in verse 9. So Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9. This is what the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Rome. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be consistent in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. <clears throat> bless those who persecute you. Bless those, uh, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. So if confession, as we were talking about, leads to humility and then unity, what does unity look like when it's achieved? And I think we see it in this passage. The answer is love, genuine, intimate, forgiving love. For the scriptures, love is the foundation. The, the, Jesus says, 
all the laws and the prophets hang on these two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, and love your neighbor as yourself. And, and so then, love is extremely important to the gospel. The, Paul, in many of his letters, he'll talk about the unity in the body of Christ. He'll talk about the, the gifts of the Spirit that God has given each of one of us to, who believe in him to build up the body of Christ in unity and in love. And then he talks specifically about love. We, we find this in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And then we have the passage in 13 where geez, Paul talks about love. We, we have it in Ephesians 5, uh, 4 and 5, where Paul gives a, an explanation about the gifts of the Spirit. And then he breaks into this. Uh, he, he talks then about unity and love. And he says specifically this in Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. He says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That when we think about love, we think our first thought should be to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. When we think about love, what did Jesus do when it says that he loved us? It says he gave up his life for us. He became, he received the punishment of our sins so that we could receive his righteousness. So that when Jesus died on the cross, he took our punishment so that we could enter into eternity with God. And so Jesus loved us in a deep, humble, sacrificial, broken way. And we can call God Father as a result. Here's the problem we have with love in our modern culture is love is self-indulgent and emotional. Love is kind of this Disney princess kind of feeling that it's, 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 it's how I feel. It's when I feel good about somebody, then clearly I love them. And this is not what the Bible points to for love. See, the problem is, is when we have it that way, it's, it's, we get really confused about love. Like, I can say I love salted caramel ice cream in a waffle cone. And then, since Friday was my anniversary, I said to Jen, I love you, while licking a waffle cone. So, so which is it? Like, it, it, is that comparable? And, and we get confused because we think the indulgence of something like eating a waffle cone is the same thing I should have when loving another person. Or let's put it this way. It can also become really, really fickle. I, I, I have to confess the sin of being a, a Philadelphia Eagles fan. Um, unless you like the Eagles, then, I, then, I'm, uh, then I'm with you. But uh, <laughs> the problem is, is if you're a Philadelphia sports team fan, in the first quarter, you're like, yeah, I love the Eagles. And by the time you get to the fourth quarter, you're like, I hate them so much. How did they do that? They, they had the lead up until the fourth quarter, and then they blew it at the, the last moment. And then, so then you go from, I love the Eagles, to I hate the Eagles. And then, it, 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 do you see that when we, when we base love strictly on the indulgent emotions like the culture tells us to, it becomes fickle and dangerous and we lose the longevity that God created us to have in our relationships. And so we need to understand that when Paul is talking about love, this is a gospel-founded new life in Christ. And so here is my definition of love. It's not um, all that fluffy, but I think it is profound for us to understand because I think this is how we see God loving his people. Is this is how I define love. Love is a covenant you make to prioritize another for their good. Love is a covenant to prioritize another for their good. I've heard it said that the difference between a covenant and contract, a contract's like, okay, I'm working for my boss. If I work this number of hours, he's going to give me this amount of money. And if he doesn't give this, me this amount of money, then I'm no longer going to be working for him because he's broken the contract. Or if I don't, break, if I don't work for him, he won't pay me money. And so there's this, there's this uh, 
you know, I'm going to give you this, you're going to give me that. There's a very uh, a reciprocity, but with covenant, it is, it is, this is what I'm giving you. When I married my wife 21 years ago, I said, I made a covenant with her. I said, for sickness and in health, richer, poorer, good times and bad. I'll even let you hold the remote control. Um, that, that it wasn't here, it wasn't, oh Jen, when you make good apple pies for me, when you cook all my meals just right, when you do this, that, and the other, then I will stay married to you. No, it's I made the promise to her, this is what I am giving to her with no expectation. And, and she made the same to me. Because in this covenant, I demonstrated my love towards Jen. Not every love requires a ceremony like marriage, but it, the point is there, is that when we as the body of Christ live together, we are covenanting to prioritize one another for each other's good and the glory of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, it no longer becomes about me, but it becomes about the glory of Jesus Christ. It becomes about our love and unity together reflecting God and then we can truly grow and display the love of God to a world in desperate need of this love. So Paul starts, he says, he, he, he kind of uh, gives a heading for the whole section. Um, it's really fascinating in the Greek, but I'll spare you the Greek lesson. But he says, let love be genuine. And he uses this really neat word that means... Uh, well, it's anupokritos, so I guess I will give you the Greek lesson. Uh, <laughs> anupokritos, a, 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 somebody who's uprikit is, uh, is a masked stage actor. Same word we get the word hypocrite from. Um, and so the masked stage actor might play several different parts in the, on the, in the stage on the Greek theater, and he would play the parts by holding up a mask and saying his lines, then holding up another mask and saying those lines, and... and there was even during Paul's time a sense that somebody who was holding up the um, masks were fake. That you could call somebody fake by calling them a masked stage actor, a, a, a hypocrite. And Paul's saying, don't be this. He's, he's saying, don't unmask your love towards one another. He's, he's saying, he's saying, make your love real, no cap. And I was reading this week that the uh, that rappers, you can tell the real rappers from the fake rappers because the real rappers, they'll get like all the, the, the diamonds on their teeth. And, but they get the diamonds and gold and all the hardware on their teeth and they get it implanted into their teeth so that it's, so that it's solid. It's in there. And that's a genuine rapper. But the, the fake rappers get the little caps that they can slide onto their teeth and uh, they can pop them off for job interviews or to go to court or uh, whatever they need to do. Um, <laughs> and so Paul's saying make your love no cap make it genuine make it real make it deep part of who you are and how you live it out though he wasn't using Gen Z lingo at the time but uh, <laughs> it is important that we understand that, that Paul intends for us and, and the, God through his Holy Spirit, intends for us to love one another in deep, real, genuine, humble, beautiful, broken ways so that we live this thing we call the Christian life out together. And so we're going to look at, kind of just run this passage. We're going to look at the first half and we're just going to hit just about every verse just bang, 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 bang. And then we're going to look at the second half of this passage and group a couple of verses together. Because what's happening in this passage is, is I believe that the Paul's first addresses the church and says, church, this is how you live this out together. 
And then there's a middle part where it's kind of like, this is how you live it out with the church and also with those outside of the church. And then the final part is clearly outside of the church. What do you do when the world comes against us and tries to persecute us? How do we love well, even in the midst of persecution? And so it's very similar to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus tells us to play for those who persecute us. So we're going to kind of look at those two functions. How do we love well inside the church? And how do we love well outside of the church? And how do we do it with the, in the name and for the glory of Jesus Christ. So we're just going to kind of start going through the verses. He, he says, Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. And this is important, I think, is that, that there's two sides to this. When we love God well, when we see the glory and the beauty and the majesty of God, when we see his justice in profound and wonderful ways, we will love those elements of God and we will hate the things that bring destruction to the name of Jesus. And, and sometimes I don't think we, and, and this is throughout all of the Psalms and the scriptures, that we would hate those things that bring dishonor to the name and justice and holiness of God. And I think this is something we need to take seriously is that we would hate sin. That's, that's really what confession and repentance is all about, that we would hate sin so much that we would long to turn from it. That, here's the thing is, is that when we see our brothers and sisters in Christ starting to sin, do we hate the sin so much that we would lovingly and humbly and broken ways confront them and say, hey, you're heading down a path of brokenness that will lead to your destruction. When we do this, we are not, we, we aren't doing it just to be judgy. We're doing it because we recognize the, the, the horror of that sin that's leading them down a path of destruction. And we hate it that they, they have, we hate the sin that has ensnared them. We do not hate the person, but we hate the sin that has ensnared them. And we long for them to be freed from that snare. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing the Corinthian church and there's sin in that church. And, and in 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, Paul's talking about a, a, a man who is having an affair with his mother-in-law. And Paul says he's delivering that man over to Satan. And we think, oh my goodness, that's really harsh. Why would you do that, Paul? It, it, he says because he hopes that in so doing, he would recognize the error of his ways and turn and repent and be made whole in Jesus Christ once again. And when we love people well we, and we confront them when they are heading down a broken path, it's not because we are judging anybody, but because we long to see them made whole in Jesus Christ. We, we do it recognizing, as Jesus says, the logs in our own eyes. We recognize that we have fallen short of the glory of God, recognizing that we are broken and need of a Savior as well. And we are trusting in the same grace that saved us to save them. But, but we need to be able to say in loving ways that we hate your sin. We love you. We want to see you restored in Jesus Christ. But we hate the sin that has ensnared you in this moment. Please do not allow it to destroy you. And so we hold fast to what is good. We hold fast to the truth of the gospel. That in Jesus Christ, through his death and burial on the cross, Death on the cross and burial, we have victory over sin and death. Be and because he rose again, we know that that victory over sin and death is true. We hold fast to the fact that we have forgiveness of sin in him. That he, that he is gracious and generous to us when we repent. And so we, we hold fast with one another in this truth. And we love one another well and help each other seek the goodness of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in brokenness at the foot of the cross. Next is to love, in verse 10, one another in brotherly affection. This is the Greek word Philadelphia. I didn't mean to reference Philadelphia twice in the same sermon, but um, here we are. <laughs> the, the Greek word Philadelphia is the idea of brotherly love or, or affection. And it's... Paul is telling us to have kind affections for one another. That we would 
We genuinely desire to be in each other's presence. That even if we are rubbing against each other, that we would long to have those rubbings kind of sanded off and, and that we would, as uh, Proverbs say, that we, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, that we would sharpen one another in the love of Jesus Christ and that we would desire to be with one another. It's one reason why I, 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 I knew I was in the right place when I became your pastor. It's because I really enjoy board meetings here. <laughs> I enjoy elders meetings so much, I actually look forward to them. I like mark them on my calendar. It's like, all right, I get to go with the, talk with the elders today. And I tell my other pastors that sometimes they're like, lucky? Um, <laughs> but I have genuine affection for my brothers in Christ. I, I have genuine affection. I look forward to coming and fellowshipping with you on Sunday mornings when we have fellowship events and when we pray together down at the end of service, when we, when we are together as a body, I, I long for that. It is, it is the highlight of my life to be in fellowship with you. And, and so he says, love one another with bodily affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. He's saying, I want you to be competitive in the way you honor one another. And the way you love one another, compete. Not competing for who's going to win, but who's going to get the other person to win first. <laughs> um, it's like, I want to show you honor so much. I'm just going to find ways to honor you. And, and then you would turn around and you'd be like, I want to show this person honor so much. I'm going to find ways to honor. And that we would be just looking for every opportunity to honor and love on one another in such a way that it's, it's almost a competition to see who can show the humble love of Jesus Christ more to one another. That we would, that, that we would do this in, a, in a, just a, a beautiful, loving, fun, exciting way that we would show one another honor in this, I don't know if one-upsmanship is the right word, but um, that we would love one another in this way. That we would seek to elevate one another. And that, because really that's what happens in, in the community of the Trinity. We believe in one God who exists for eternity and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son. The Son glorifies the Father. The Father sends the Holy Spirit. And then together we have this perfect community and unity where, where God is exalting himself in this perfect community for eternity. And so when we exalt, when we honor one another in, in loving, genuine ways, we're displaying the unity and love within the, within the Trinity. I mean, isn't that what Jesus prayed to the Father in the garden? He said, may they be one as we are one. The Son praying to the Father, may they be one as we are one. That in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we would honor one another in the same way that the, the Godhead shows its love. Shows his love. So let's, let's be a church that is generous in the way we honor one another. Next it says, Do not be slothful in zeal, but fervent in the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Do you get excited to be with the church? Do you get excited by the idea of, I get to come to Sunday, I get to come and be in the body of believers so that we can glorify to God together, that we can make disciples and search the lost? Is that something that excites you? So it's, it's very easy to get stuck in that rhythm that, you know, it becomes just this weekly rhythm and it becomes just this thing I do because I've been doing it for the past 40 years of going to church every Sunday. So, um, you know, I better get up on Sunday morning and I, you know, I, just because it's what I've always been doing. And we lose our zeal for encountering a glorious, beautiful God. 
that when we come together, especially corporately for worship on Sunday mornings in this body, that we would come anticipating that God will move in our midst. That we come together specifically in this format on Sunday morning expecting the movement of the Holy Spirit. That this, I believe the worship service is not about us, it's about God. We don't worship on Sunday morning so that we feel good about ourselves. We worship so that God would be glorified above all else, specifically in my heart. And, and I think this is what Paul is saying is don't be slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit in serving the Lord. That this desire to see God glorified above all else would transform the way we live it out together and serve one another together and serve the broken world around us together. And it wouldn't be, we, we wouldn't be doing it for our own name or our own glory, but for the glory of Jesus Christ. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be consistent in prayer or constant in prayer. Life is hard. I think what Paul is saying is life is hard and let's do these hard things together. And let us rejoice in the hope we have in Jesus Christ. That this mortality we have is merely physical. We have hope for eternity in, in Jesus Christ. We have hope that, that one day we will be with our Heavenly Father for eternity. That we will fellowship in the body of Christ for eternity together. So that when we are going through these hard times, when things seem to be falling apart, that we would be patient in those tribulations. We would be patient in those dark times. And that together we would be lifting each other up. That we, together we would be praying for one another. Together we would be holding each other fast in those dark times. Because there are times where one person, one family will go through a dark time where another time is going through a time of rejoicing. We'll get to that in just a second. But we need each other in both of those moments to hold one another together. This is something I think is, is hard to do in the northeastern United States is that we don't, it, it's hard to be vulnerable with one another in the Northeast. It's hard to share with one another when we are going through those dark times. And as a result, the church, we have difficulty ministering to one another because we haven't been vulnerable to say, hey, I am in this broken moment. Would you walk alongside with me? Or if we see somebody going through that broken moment, we don't want to intrude in their life and be able to say, hey, I see you're going through this dark time. Can I walk alongside with you? When I was training to be a chaplain, they said 90% of ministry is just showing up. And in those dark times, 90% of it, it, you don't need the right thing to say, just be there. And that we would hold each other together, pointing to the hope we have in Jesus Christ in prayer, in constant prayer, even in the midst of darkest tribulation. Contribute to the needs of the saints and se seek to show hospitality. Again, looking around, finding ways to outdo one another and showing honor, but that we would contribute to one another's needs. That my hope is that we would be such a generous church that people's needs would be met even before they even realized that they were that, that that specific thing was a need. We are a generous church, but I, want, I, I would love to see us be, be such a generous church that, that people might even accuse us of being communist. Though, let's not be actual communists, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but that we, we love each other with such generosity that, that there is just a unity in that generosity. 
in Senegal, and, and the way we do this often is showing hospitality. In Senegal, I learned a lot about hospitality. When you made a meal, you always made a little bit extra for that person who was going to come down the road that you might not even know. And then um, uh, they, they, you offer them food from your table. And, and the, the table is actually just a bowl. You all eat out of the exact same bowl. So hospitality is really close and intimate. First couple of times you eat out of the same bowl with everybody, it's like, okay, this is, I don't know quite how to make it, but by the end, by the time we left, it was like, it was one of the most beautiful things to be able to share a common bowl with a group of, of people, especially in the body of Christ. And, and so this is really, I, somebody made this distinction for me, I can't remember who, but there's a difference between hospitality and entertainment. And, and there's a place for both, but entertainment is where you get the house just absolutely perfect, you know, you get break out the fine china. You know, you, 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 if there's any dirty dishes, you put them in the oven so nobody can see them. Uh, <laughs> I saw this thing on, on the internet where somebody got created, it printed out a, a, a picture of the top of their sink, or the, the, their, their sink empty, and then they rolled that picture out over their sink covered with dirty dishes so that people, as they come by, would just see an empty sink if they glanced closely, or too, if they didn't, didn't glance too closely. But, but that's entertainment, and there's a place for that. But in entertainment, there's a lot of facade and, and, um, and pomp and circumstances. But hospitality is, is letting people into your home and life, even when everything is grimy. Hospitality is, is about I am letting you not just into my house, but into my home and into my life. Yes, I am going to allow you to see the, the rough edges around me because I know that God is working on them. And I, I can trust that in this moment, we will draw nearer together because we are showing love and hospitality with one another. And I think this is something, again, we in the Northeast need to learn uh, more and more is what does it mean to show hospitality? What does it mean to let other people into our lives? That instead of turning our, our, our house into our castle, we, uh, we turn it into the hub of our community. And then in this way, we become a generous congregation who shares our lives with one another. Now, moving on through the, uh, this particular chapter in Romans, we're going to come to the next section. I'm going to read a, several passages together now. Um, we're going to read verses four, 14 through 16, where it says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. I think here, and especially in all of these passages, Paul recognizes that life is messy. And, and even in the body of Christ, we struggle. And so as we look at this passage, there's, there's parts of it where we're going to even dress in just a second, but I want to look at this one line here where it says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That this is profoundly important, but not necessarily easy. I, I think of uh, when my younger brother, probably 13 years ago, his, his wife, became pregnant with their first child. And I remember him announcing it at Christmas, but that was the Christmas where after seven years of infertility, where Jen and I had just been praying and praying and praying and praying for children, Jen had a miscarriage. And it was just one of the biggest gut punches of our entire life. And here's my brother in this moment, his wife is pregnant with their first son. So what does that look like in that moment? Because here's my brother who's rejoicing and here's me who's mourning. In that moment, we needed to rejoice. We needed to mourn 
together. Can't say that either of us did it particularly well on that Christmas, but we've got plenty of practice since then. Um, but we need to enter into the highs and lows of each other's lives. That, that when we are mourning, we mourn together. When we are rejoicing, we rejoice together. Sometimes they happen and it feels like it's simultaneously or back to back. Like the, the day that Hannah was born was the same day that, that they had the funeral for Jen's sister. And what do you do in that moment where you are both rejoicing and mourning simultaneously? When we do this together well, we walk through the messy portions of life together and we hold each other up. We celebrate and we rejoice together. We mourn and we cry together. And sometimes it's hard to tell which are the tears of joy and which are the tears of mourning. And we are grateful that together as one family in Christ, we know that we aren't alone. It's profoundly important that we love in a genuine messy, humble way. Now the final section. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For so, by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, uh, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You see, I think we as Christians have this very unique uh, uh, outlook on life. Any other uh, world view or, or religious system has a very big difficulty with forgiveness and allowing vengeance to rest with God. Because what happens for us as Christians, is that we know that all sin will be covered by the wrath of God. That, that God will take care of those brokennesses and injustices that bring dishonor and, and horror to the truth of who God is. Now, there's one of two places that that Brokenness and injustice will be taken care of. The first is on the cross of Jesus Christ. He died for my sins. He died for your sins on the cross. The sins of my enemies, the sins of those who have, who have, who have wounded me deeply, Jesus took on the cross. He bore the wrath of that was due those punishments. And so that when, especially when another brother or sister in Christ sins against me, I don't seek vengeance because I know it has already been avenged on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. I know my sins have already been avenged on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And so then I no longer need to seek vengeance, but I trust the Lord and his grace and salvation. There are those who will not put their faith in Jesus Christ and there will be a day at the end of all things where God will bring final judgment upon all enemies of God. And in, those day, in that day, we can trust that God will be just and good and holy. As we see in Revelation 19, it is not the armies of God that do battle, but Jesus himself with the sword of the word of God that comes out of his mouth and vanquishes his enemies with just a word. 
and we do nothing but observe. In our dress uniform, we observe. And so then, we don't have to worry, is this offense against me going to be, is it going to be satisfied? Yes, either on the shoulders of Jesus Christ, which we hope that's where it gets justified. That's where it gets taken care of because then we know we've gained a brother and sister in Christ, especially one who might persecute us. But if not, we know that Jesus is just and will take care of it all at the end of all things. And so we don't have to worry about avenging ourselves. That's why Jesus says we can pray for those who persecute us. We can love them in ways that that they don't deserve because we know that that persecution against us will be taken care of by Jesus Christ. And and so now we do, we do the opposite. We do good to those who persecute us. I, I'm t- I am certain that as we go further and further into um, this age as a nation, we will, as the, Christ, as the Christian church, experience more and more opposition to genuinely loving Jesus Christ and community. And so how will we respond to that when that time comes? When we experience genuine persecution, will we, experience, will we respond with love? Will we respond with the grace that Jesus has shown us? And when we do that, when we, when we love like Jesus loved us, then it says he heaps burning coals on their head. And so the, the, the thought is, well, now I'm just going to burn, you know, Stoke his head with fire. I'm just going to put fire on this person's head because he's being mean to me. And that's actually, I don't believe what Paul is saying here. Is he's referencing, actually, I, I believe, a, a, an ancient um, repentance ceremony, actually, where, you know, it talks about the people would put themselves in sackcloth and ashes. Well, one of the repentance ceremonies, they put a brazier on their head and put hot coals in the brazier to demonstrate how repentant they were. They put more and more coals on their head. And as they do that, what Paul is saying is is that when you uh, do good to those who are persecuting you, when you repay evil with good, the hope is that they would turn and repent. And the worse their persecution, the more glorious their repentance. The worse the sin against the body of Christ the more God's grace is revealed. That is the hope and the desire when in, in this moment. It's, it's not just to put fire on somebody's head, but instead it's that the, the coals of the glorious repentance in Jesus Christ would be seen by everyone. So my hope for us as a community of Christ is that we would be unified that we would be humble and vulnerable with one another, that we would be generous with one another, that we would allow one another into our lives, especially in those messy parts, and that alongside one another, we would seek to model the repentance and forgiveness and grace we have in Jesus Christ. That we would be a church that confesses our sins to one another. That we don't do this, that, that, that we don't hear confession in a haughty way, but in a humble and broken way, recognizing that in my own life, my sins nailed Jesus to the cross. And so that we would rejoice in repentance, that we would rejoice in the confession of sin, that we would be a church that so honestly loves one another, that the world around us would absolutely be transformed. My hope is that we would be a congregation of revival. And I believe that what we have talked about this summer is the starting point of revival. I long for us to be a unified congregation 
I long for us to display the love of Jesus Christ to one another in such a way that the world around us says there's something different going on here at Maranatha Bible Chapel. We need to take a look. My desire is that our love for one another would be deep and real and genuine. No cap. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this congregation. Transform us, Lord, into your image, into your glory, so that, that when you return, Lord, we may, Lord, we may have proclaimed a thousand times over the glory of your goodness and forgiveness and grace by the way we have displayed it to one another in this congregation and the way we model it to a world in need of your salvation. So I pray we are a church of genuine, real love and that we worship you in new and deep ways because of it. I pray this in your beautiful and holy name. Amen. My hope is that we would be a generous church that loves well. That we wouldn't be afraid to get messy with one another. Wouldn't be afraid of experiencing the grimier parts of life together so that we can go together to the cross and receive restoration and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. So let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I praise you for Maranatha Bible Chapel. I'm so grateful for her. That, Lord, we as your bride get to anticipate the day that you return. And I pray that every Sunday we gather together, every fellowship event we have together, every time we, we do something together as your body, Lord, we would do it in a way that, that displays and honors and glorifies who you are and your love for us. So I pray that as we strengthen, each one, strengthen one another, we love on one another and we are generous to one another, that, that we would take that love and generosity out to a world that is broken and in need of you. That we may be your ambassadors of reconciliation and wholeness to a dark and dying world. So that even when we receive persecution, the world may see that there's something different here at Maranatha Bible Chapel. So Lord, I praise you for this congregation. I pray that you would go with us as we leave from here today and that we would be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit, sanctified by the power of your Holy Spirit, and held fast by the power of your Holy Spirit until the day you return. We pray, Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come. We pray this in your holy and beautiful name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now go in peace.